Hey everybody, this is Jim Need from Jim Need Woodworks again. Um, I just finished this Sapeli bed uh, after about three months of work. Uh, it's for my daughter for her wedding present from four years ago, so I'm a little late. But uh, it was a couple of years of procrastinating because I didn't know how I was gonna cut this rope molding at the top. So I'm gonna do this video, it's a long one. It kind of goes over the components of this that are a little unique. Um, it's not step by step for every piece of this, but there's a couple things that I uh, couldn't find another way to do that I had to kind of figure something out by myself. So I wanted to put this out there. For example, these end caps, um, I cut on my CNC, but because they have a pretty detailed profile on top and the sides, I. It couldn't cut this top profile and the sides all in the rotary because it tends not to be very accurate when it has to reach in at these steep angles. And it's too far of a reach for any of my router bits, especially my fine tip ball noses for carving. So I had to do the side piece um, on the rotary and then flip it over and mill the top with a second pass. Um, I, I talked about some problems I had with warpage of these panels. All of my panels warped between the time I glued them up and when I was ready to uh, cut the raised panel profile and machine them out. So I had to uh, use a few tricks to flatten them out good enough to, to get them to be uh, workable and then get them into the rails. And most of the time I spent on how do you cut these, uh, these this top rail that's uh, kind of, it's like a four segment twisted rope. Uh, I cut this completely by hand. I couldn't figure out how to do it on my CNC. My CNC isn't big enough. I would have needed true four axis machining because it has an arch. The head would have had to move back and forth on the Y axis and my machine I use with Vectric can only really do three axis machining at a time. Um, if you do something like Fusion 360, you could do true four axis, but then you gotta pay the full license. You gotta pay the four axis machining uh, uh, cam uh, add-in. And my machine still isn't big enough anyway. So um, I ended up with hacksaws, chisels, files, and sandpaper on this. So I'll show you how I did that. And uh, there's a couple finishing uh, tips at the end, but so again, this is, Sapile, um, it's an African hardwood that looks exactly like mahogany, which is what I needed because this is going to match a mahogany bedroom set that I made 22 years ago. Um, but the bed was just a single bed at that time because she was only about this tall. So um, basically, I, mahogany is a couple, two, three dollars more expensive. It's very soft, it dents very easy. So Sapile is like a perfect substitute because it's exactly the same color it has the the quarter sun sapile has the nice stripes just like mahogany but it's cheaper and it's much harder it machines very well so um, this is an excellent wood it's beautiful um, i've seen it there's it's popular down in here in arizona for front doors and things like that now um, so it's a beautiful wood i recommend trying it out sometime if you uh, want something that's sort of the shade and, and have the nice stripe figure. Also, um, if you like this kind of video and content, uh, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed and liked on YouTube. Uh, helps me out making it worth the time to do the videos and things like that. Um, mostly I do it just for fun and to help others out, but uh, every little bit helps too. So I um, appreciate that. Thank you. I usually start my project with a simple scale drawing like this. Uh, this is the face of the footboard. Um, I don't usually CAD up the whole thing uh, unless I've got a customer that's having trouble dif uh, visualizing what the project's going to look like or I need to parameterize it so I can make adjustments to sh before they can figure out what they want. But typically, like this, my daughter gave me a nice 2D or 3D drawing of the bed and so I converted it to scale like this um, in this case the each little square is equal to two and a half inches and it's really easy to um, build things from there 
So this is about as detailed as I ever get with my plans. This is my first pile of Sapelli boards. Uh, shout out to Spellman's in downtown Phoenix. This is where I got it. They had, uh, they're, they're a big kind of wholesaler, but they also sell, uh, sell to individuals like me. Um, very good quality boards here. They had a very flat, true lumber, and they had wide boards all the way up to about 20 inches I saw in one pile. So very good selection, good price. Um, I, as usual, ended up not buying enough the first time. I always seem to manage to underestimate, so I ended up driving all the way down to, to get another load. But um, I was really happy to work with uh, good quality lumber like this. So it was very uniform in color and stripes. Here I'm putting a final really clean jointed edge on the two faces of the halves of the of the corner posts. Uh, these were eight quarter um, wide boards, so I, I cut them and ripped them in half and uh, book matched them. So the outside edges are book matched. And you can see uh, I wiped the glue on both surfaces by hand because uh, the glue itself doesn't really matter. Pretty much any wood glue, working glue is stronger than the wood if, if the joint is prepared right. And what does make a difference um, is to rub that wood in, or glue into the wood grain on both sides. Uh, if you just run a bead down the middle, you'll end up with starved joints. Uh, a lot of times, especially in Phoenix, that'll skin over before you get a chance to really work it in. So it's good to um, wipe it down good, kind of squeegee it so you don't get too thick of a layer and then get it made it together and clamped and use clamps this is a lot of surface area on these boards like this so you really need a lot of clamps and clamp it from both sides so you get a uniform uh, thin glue line when you're making a nice product or project with uh you know wood like this where you really want to show off the grain and stuff especially when you have big panels so this has the the big uh, raised panels on it you really want to do a good job up front of matching your board so that they kind of have symmetrical widths and the color and the stripes are very um, homogeneous across the panels so in this case I kind of laid all of my panels out uh, my panel boards to make sure that I kind of group them for each panel the way they look similar and like the left and the right panels match symmetrically on on each the headboard and the footboard as well. Okay, this is I what usually wait till the glue is kind of rubbery, but these these drips don't have too much like liquid glue left and they're all just kind of rubbery or like soft plastic and that way when they pop they don't smear soft glue everywhere but they're soft enough that they don't tear up the wood fibers so and I just use a really old chisel and just scrape them off and they come right off nicely and clean this up if you wait till it gets too hard it tears up the fibers and you can leave you can have like a trench along the, the line that you have to sand through or plane off again so I like to do this um, just get down to the point where there's not too much glue left and that way it won't clog up the sandpaper too bad when you're sanding it. So, and if you skew the chisel sideways a little bit when you slide along, that helps to slice off the glue without tearing up the wood fibers. And that way, if you, because if you just rip it right up, especially as I said, when it's a little bit harder, it's really easy to tear up the fibers and then you have to really sand, do a lot of sanding to get a nice smooth flat surface again. The width of the headboard and footboard is about 83 inches so I only have a four foot by four foot CNC so that means to cut the rails out and the rope molding pieces I have to cut uh, cut it in two halves. Unfortunately Vectric is uh, VCAR Pro has a nice feature where you can chop your um, job up into smaller segments so in this case I split the job exactly in the middle um, symmetrically so I can flip it over um, and do half and half in each direction so that's what I'm doing here is cutting a piece of the rope molding um, board in the first half. 
and here I'm cutting the other half so I, I take it off I flip it over I'm referencing the same edge of the board on the same stop so that uh, makes it um, have a repeatable reference and so because the piece is symmetrical uh, it I don't really have any problems lining up the first and the second halves of the cuts these, these came out very nice and I didn't hardly have to sand the the place where the two uh, parts or two halves came together the rope molding piece needs to be about three inches in diameter when I'm done so I started with two four quarter halves and glued them together and then milled them down so that uh, I got around three inches square cross section to start with and here are the two final blanks for the rope molding the CNC is really nice for cutting for these large panel projects for a couple of reasons. One is it saves on a lot of time um, before I would have had to make a template, then bandsaw these out, and then run them on the drum sander to even them out and everything. And with this, I can make one set of cuts and have a very clean result that needs minimal sanding. The other thing that's really nice is in the, in the template process, normally when you do this and you go from the top rail to the rope molding to the top of the panels you have to be careful to make when you're tracing your patterns to keep them uh, the distance perpendicular to the line you're tracing if you're um, using a scribe or something otherwise they won't match up properly um, when they when they come together but in CAD software it's very easy to draw your first arch that you want and then go up and down the project from there and always keep them the same because you can draw another line that's got this you know equidistant or uh, distance that you want like in this case this rail is five inches so the top line is a matching line from the rope molding and then the bottom line I just simply make one that's five inches uh, from the other one and so it's very easy to make these all line up very nicely the CNC is also nice for handling things when they're kind of awkward. So normally I would cut tenons like this on the table saw. In this case though, these boards are too long to stand up on my table saw, even though I have 10 foot ceilings. Um, and they're kind of awkward because they're curved to get through the bandsaw very well too. So in this case, it's easiest to lay them down in the CNC and use a pocketing tool path to uh, mill each side out like this. Here I'm just doing a quick test fit so that the ends of the styles, I can see they match up with the rails uh, on the curve. So uh, before I go over to the router table um, to cut the raised panel, use the raised panel bit set uh, to, to finish these panels. Then we cut the rails and st styles on the router table. And another quick test fit just to make sure that the rails and styles fit together properly now. And at this point I can double check my dimensions inside the slots for the panels before I cut the panels. And here I'm cutting out the first panel of the four. All right, this panel I want to cut out, but um, I don't know if you can see very well in the camera here, but this panel has developed a really nice bow kind of in its kind of like a pretzel right now, or, or a potato chip here in the middle. So it's bowed up, and I could probably clamp it down enough, um, but you can see it's... You know not sitting flat at all so I'm gonna try and straighten this out what what I do is just take some water and a sponge and I'm gonna wet the inside of this and what that'll do is expand it and bow it the opposite direction that it is now and and then I'm gonna just kind of wait until it gets approximately flat and then quick clamp it down and machine it so you can also see that brings out the nice stripes in the sapile but uh, so it's gonna look really great when it's finished but uh, this is kind of something you can do to counteract the bow and get it flat I'm gonna need to do this again when I put this on my router table to cut the 
kind of the ra the raised the edge around the raised panel. So uh, this is a way you can kind of temporarily flatten it out. Um, I don't want to machine it when it's this bowed. Obviously, I can't route it on the router table because it would never sit down flat. Um, I could use a hand router on it, but so I'm going to keep putting some water on this side. You can see it's already drying off really fast because uh, it's probably around three to five percent humidity here in Arizona right now. So stuff dries really fast. So I'm going to keep sponging it down until this thing straightens out. Turned out to be so hot and dry in May this uh, when I was trying to do this that I ended up having to really soak the wood and then coat it with or cover it with uh, saran wrap to keep the water from evaporating otherwise I just couldn't keep these boards wet enough so I sealed it up and let it sit for a while um, to get this one to straighten out. Alright this has been sitting here for a couple of hours I just took the plastic uh, seal wrap off the top is probably a little less than an eighth inch maybe a hundred thousandths gap yet um, but this is just sitting here free so this will clamp down on my CNC easily so uh, it it works pretty well wet it down good put the put some kind of a plastic uh, sealer over the top or flip it upside down on a tabletop or something just you want to seal that kind of keep the moisture in it's just so dry here that if I didn't have something on it the the water just evaporated right off the top without um, getting into the wood and causing it to uh, warp the other direction. So this works really well um, kind of in those situations where it warps on you before you get done machining it. All right, I just got done cutting the raised panel profile on this uh, footboard panel. Um, turned out pretty good. One thing I had to do is straighten this out again. Um, but the water trick that I used when I was cutting out these panels on the CNC did work. The problem was it's so dry here right now that I couldn't keep the water on long enough to soak into the board, board and expand it. And the other thing I was having a trouble with was making it very localized. Like if you look at this panel, you can see down the side here, it's almost perfectly straight from about here to the end and then on this side it's almost perfectly straight for the first foot and the actual all of this bowing that you see here is in is confined to about three or four inches on this one board and that's exactly where the other panel too is it was the same board that was cut in half to on the other panel so there's something about the the pattern in this board in this one area there's some stress in it or something and it's and it's warping there and the other ones aren't and rather than try the water again I went looking online and somebody had a really neat trick using a heat gun and what they did was flip this over and they they find the high spot here so you know with playing around with this uh, um, ruler I can look on the bottom too and, and find out where the high spot is but once you find the high spot here on the crown you take a heat gun and heat this uh, carefully you don't want to burn the wood and then if you're by a glue line you have to be careful because most of these uh, yellow wood glues are thermal setting and you can actually melt them open and, and break your joint open um, but if it's in the wood area you basically get this wood hot enough that you can't touch it so you heat it up really good on this one side and then let it cool down and as it cools it actually shrinks this top surface on the crown it shrinks it down to more than it was before and, and there it sort of straightens it out and then the other thing that I did um, was I clamped this down to my surface with the wood clamp and I propped it up a little bit here so I kind of over bent it backwards and that actually helped straighten it out uh, during the cooling process even more and it I did that with this panel and I was able to uh, cut that pretty well um, on the router table without having to really stand on it to get it flat so I could get a uniform cut around it so I'm gonna show doing that in uh, elapsed time on this one and we'll see how it comes out so just as a starting reference it's sitting on the straight 
table saw, the cutoff guide, and you can see there's a good quarter inch gap here on this middle. So let's see what we end up with when we're done trying to straighten this out. Okay, so here I'm first kind of uh, checking where the bow is, marking the, the center of the bowed area so that I know where to apply the heat. Again, this panel is bowed in a very small strip down one of the boards. I only want to apply the heat there, um, not anywhere else. And so I'm applying the heat on the crown of the bend um, because when it cools back down, it'll pull back together. And then when I'm all done applying the heat, I'm going to clamp it down to help it bend back in place as it's cooling down. Okay, in the end, my first panel was a bit warped, but I could machine it uh, without any um, straightening. The next two panels between moisture on one and moisture and heat on the third one, I was able to get them flat enough uh, to be able to get through the router table and the CNC machine. The fourth one was so warped that I simply could not straighten it out with anything. You can see here I had a soaked towel on it. I mean, I had a quart of water sitting on this for several hours and it didn't straighten out at all, um, or at least not anywhere close enough to be acceptable. And it was already cut out on the CNC machine actually, because uh, it worked a little bit afterwards. And in the end, I just couldn't get it through the router table. So I ended up having to make the fourth panel over again. Um, I, it was already cut out in the CNC so there, and there wasn't enough width remaining that I could uh, slice it with the, uh, with the table saw and, and rejoin and re-glue it. So I ended up making one. Fortunately, I had a spare board that was very well matched to the other ones uh, that I could make a new panel. The rope mold blanks were also too awkward of shape and size to cut in my normal method. So again, uh, I used the CNC to cut the tenons uh, on those pieces. And here's the final tenon. Here I'm using an inch and a half radius roundover bit on the router table to turn the square blank into pretty close to a round blank. This is a really large bit and it's not covered by a guard since this is a um, curved piece of lumber. So when doing an operation like this, be very careful where you uh, have your fingers and to hang on to the workpiece very well. Then I used a coarse rasp and then a fine file and then 150 grit sandpaper to get rid of the final unevenness from the roundover bits and turn this into a pretty close to the circle uh, rate uh, profile, cross section profile, um, so we can start the carving work next. All right, before I start carving the rope pattern into the molding piece, I need to cut a groove on the bottom side of of the workpiece so that it can fit down on top of the top rail of the raised panel assembly. So I could have tried to do this on the CNC, but it's much easier just to use a, a quick built router jig like this. So I'm using a slot cutting router bit with a bearing on it, guide bearing, and then I'm just adjusting the uh, router to different heights uh, to essentially cut out a, the wide groove similar to how you'd cut a wide groove with a table saw by moving the fence over. So this is the cutting operation using that slot cutting bit to uh, slice the big groove down the, down the bottom edge centered uh, on the rope molding piece. Okay the very first thing you have to do when you're carving some kind of pattern like this is to figure out what's the shape and you know the size of the rope and what kind of how tight of a twist do you want so I started kind of with some different pieces of tape that I had on rolls to kind of figure that out and this yellow tape I had it was about I think inch and a quarter inch and a half wide you know I kind of played with it uh, trying it at different angles until it was the way I liked it 
this ended up to essentially create a twist of four sections of rope that went around each other uh, down the length of the molding piece. And so um, once I got this to where I liked it, then we move on to <clears throat> measuring what the gap is between those pieces. So here I use the caliper to measure the gap between the first couple pieces of tape and then I took that same gap and I marked it down the glue line on the top and the bottom of the rope molding piece and this is going to be my guide to mark the spirals with the pencil around so that we can later cut on the lines and create the the uh, spacing the correct spacing and twist for the rope mold so now that i've got the spacing marked on the glue line i can take a strip of cardboard uh, this isn't cardboard corrugated cardboard it's more like i think from a shoe box kind of cardboard just thick enough so that it's kind of holds a straight shape and allows you to run a pencil along the edge easily um, it works well to use a couple of clamps to kind of hold it in place um, but since this uh, the profile of this rope molding has an arch in it you kind of have to move it around a little bit because uh, it doesn't it doesn't wrap perfectly evenly across the since it's not straight so uh, clamp it in place kind of loosely and then just mark a couple of strands of the rope at a time um, making sure you have the upper and lower pencil marks aligned with the, the cardboard. This works pretty well. Um, doesn't take too long to mark the whole piece. Okay, I kind of got my procedure down after doing half of one of these, um, so kind of know what works. So, you saw before I marked the spirals uh, with a strip of paper, kind of, or thick card or cardboard basically so I could wrap it around um, and had measured even spacing on the top and the bottom to kind of keep the pitch the same as I went along so the, the things we're going to need now to actually cut the uh, rope pattern in here is a hacksaw um, I'm using just a plain old hacksaw but with an 18 uh, tooth pitch on here it's the coarsest uh, tooth I could find or coarsest blade. Uh, the reason is I want it to cut wood pretty well and be able to uh, kind of change angles on here so I wanted it to tear out some pretty good wood. Then I've got a carving chisel um, that's got the kind of the the radius that I'm going to want to round over these ropes. Um, this is probably about an inch or so radius chisel. Then the next thing after we chisel is going to be filing down kind of shaping and getting the chisel marks out with a file. So I use a fine uh, curve. It's a flat one side curved on the other side file. You'll probably want to have a handle on this because you're going to be doing this for hours. Um, and then some 150 grit sandpaper. So this is kind of the final shaping um, and it gets the chisel marks out. And when, once you're done with the 150 grit, now you've got a nice uh, shape and got all the marks out. Then you can find sand from there, either with sandpaper or like a drill and a rotary brush wheel. Um, but those are the four things that we use to, to cut the shapes. Um, when you're chiseling and when you're filing, you're definitely going to wear want to want some gloves or something unless you have super thick calluses on your skin because after about an hour I had band-aids and tape all over my fingers I mean you're you're really pushing on this for a long time and you'll need about a 55 gallon drum of elbow grease uh, this first half took me about 10 hours to do so it takes it's long tedious work but it's pretty cool when it's done so um, you know it's uh, it's it's going to make the project look pretty cool, but that's what we're going to need. So now we'll get into uh, actually starting the first step. Okay, let's start with the hacksaw. Now you'll notice I've got this mounted my lathe. I didn't actually use the lathe for anything. I've got it powered off. But this piece is kind of awkward to hold. Um, I can hold it in my bench vise 
in two of the positions but you actually need to kind of you can't work on too much of the radius at a time or arc so you kind of want to be able to turn it maybe 30 degree increments and I can't really do that in my vice very well because of the shape of this curve and it doesn't work very good on the bench either so this is a good way um, to hold it I basically just have one end sitting up at the same height to keep this level and then I've got it chucked up in my four jaw chuck and then I can use my indexer on the lathe just to hold it so I can rotate it to different positions that are convenient so that's also very helpful if you have a lathe so um, what we're going to do I'm just going to start in the middle here but uh, you can see how much paint I took off of this blade it's it's a new blade and that's about all as deep as I'm cutting so maybe around a quarter inch uh, is all you need to cut when you get to chiseling you're going to get a little deeper with the chiseling and then when you're filing and sanding it'll get deeper as well so you really only need to cut about a quarter inch with the saw um, you could probably use like a dovetail saw or something too but uh, this hacksaw works well so I'm just gonna start on the line and as I go around you'll see I've you want to keep the saw as you go around perpendicular to where you're cutting so when I'm up here I'm perpendicular and as I rotate around I don't want it leaning like it was up here I want to actually keep coming around and rotating the saw because I want a perpendicular cut all the all the way and which is difficult because it wants to pinch the blade so you kind of need to take little short strokes and then keep just keep mindful of rotating it and cut really shallow to start with and that way it won't get hung up so I kind of just keep cutting and rotating like this and what that does is uh, cuts the kerf out wider so the blade can rotate and keep perpendicular to the cutting piece and then as I go around this way I have to rotate the opposite direction so, so that's all we're going to do just take your time and when I get down to the paint mark I just all there is to it and it just as I mentioned before takes a long time you're gonna just keep sawing away on these lines like so Okay, now we've got the whole thing sawed, and we're gonna start uh, shaping these with the chisel. So I've got, again, about an inch or inch and a half radius wood uh, spoon chisel here. And just like any time when you're using a blade on wood, you wanna go, what I, I call it downhill um, with the grain, but the grain's going this way, so if I cut this way, I'm, uh, cutting the fibers so they won't chip out. I'm kind of going downhill with the grain. If I cut on this side, I'll be cut, cutting into the grain and it'll tear out and stuff. So what I want to do is cut the right side of all of these lines this way and then I'm going to come over from the other side and cut this way on this side so that way I get the smoothest cut. So it's pretty easy. Um, it just takes a long time. <laughs> And you'll definitely want to wear gloves uh, if you're going to do very much like this because you're going to be pushing real hard on this and it just it wears out your hands. But So you're just going to come in here and just start carving this and kind of once you get in there a little bit you can use the saw curve to guide your chisel. So you're just kind of cutting around there and trying to basically just use your chisel to do a round over. Um, 
I want to get down to the bottom of that saw kerf. And what I'm trying, I'm trying to do it as smooth as possible, obviously, because I'm going to come back with the file later and, and that'll be the next pass to smooth things out. And the other thing you should always remember whether you're going to be filing next or sanding next is a gouge into the wood is much harder to get out than a high spot. So don't spend a bunch of time getting rid of the high spots up here and risk gouging like you can see I'm starting to make marks here. I don't want to do these. These are more work to get out than the high spots with the file. So uh, again, I'm trying to make a, as nice of a radius as I can, but basically make as much as least amount of work for myself the next time with the when I come by with the file. So and, and once you get used to this, you can get pretty fast. Um, so that's it. Now the bottom isn't perfect, but again, I'm going to use the file to clean that up. So um, try not to gouge deeper than the saw cut, but I'm just trying to make a nice even round over there. So and you can see once you kind of get the feel for it, it goes pretty quickly. It's not too bad. It's kind of enjoyable. Um, it's a good time to get a, a podcast or something that you like to listen to because you're going to be on this. I've got two head rail or two railings here with this molding on it. And based on how long it took me to do the first quarter of it, it's going to take me probably about 40 total hours to cut these two. So, um, yeah, you can get a lot of time listening to the radio or a podcast or something doing this. But keep your chisel sharp because that sure makes it go quicker and, and it's less work for you. And like I said, wear gloves. I'm going to put my gloves on here when I turn the camera off, but um, some places, this is, the Sapelli cuts really nice. Uh, it's, it's really a nice, subs it's a lot nicer wood than mahogany, I think, because the bat, it's, it's as pretty as mahogany for sure. It looks just like it, but um, well, right now it's a lot cheaper. It was about $2 a board foot less, and it's much harder. Uh, one thing I don't like about mahogany is it's pretty soft, so it chips pretty easy. And so this is kind of, uh, instead of calling it a substitute, I'd call it a much superior wood to mahogany. It has all the good attributes and none of the bad ones. Finish is really nice. Um, sand's really nice. It machines great. It doesn't chip out very much. Um, it's hard, but you can see. Um, I would say it's somewhere between hard maple and soft maple. Uh, I got a funny grain there. A little bit of a swirl it chipped out, but uh, it's not a. It's maybe maybe somewhere around like black walnut as far as hardness. Easily just as workable. When you're chiseling, you can see I got a little bit of a, kind of a knot. Now the grain is swirling around there, so I'm actually not cutting downhill in this one spot, so I gotta kinda be delicate about it. Be careful when you do it backwards like this, make sure you don't jab yourself from the wrist or something. And when in doubt, if it's going to start chipping out, just leave it high. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of leave it like that. It's not great, but um, the nice thing about the next step, which is the file, is it doesn't care which way the grain is going. It'll cut it off just fine. So we don't have to worry about chip out once we get past the chisel stage.
All right, now we've got this half carved. It took me a couple hours last night. And the next step is to file it and get, um, improve the shape a little bit and get, mostly get the chisel marks out before we start sanding. So the first thing I do is, uh, you can kind of see there's a bunch of rough area and uh, pieces of wood and stuff in the crack. So um, first thing I'm gonna just take the file and go back and forth. Again, kind of like the saw, keeping it perpendicular so I, I rotate it as I come around like this to clean this out. And that cleans it out very nice and gives me a nice smooth bottom groove to follow for the filing. And then the next thing I do, just like with the chiseling, is going downhill with the slope. I'm taking the flat side, that seems to work best, and just starting in the groove and kind of rotating up to give it a, a round shape. So you can see I'm shaping the round and then down in the crack I'm trying to get a very smooth transition from that bottom. Get all of those chisel marks out. And this just takes a long time but get in there so it's nice and smooth and rounded. And again, with when I come back and sand, I can take any of these ridges on the top off pretty easily, but um, these gouges are hard to remove by sanding because obviously you have to remove a whole lot of material to get down to you know that area. So again, I want to leave the file takes off material a lot faster. So the goal here is to get get rid of the scratches, nicks, and the grooves and things like that, so that. I have something left that's easy to sand. There, so these two look good. Now, now I'm going to come over and do the other angle. Because again, it works best to go from both sides. So, when I use the file again to clean out the other side of the groove a little bit, because it cleans out best on the flat edge. Okay. And, then, and again, you. <laughs> want gloves because especially where you're hanging on to it here and if you don't have a good handle you might want to get one this one is a just an attachable uh, file handle and it works great but even after even holding on to this handle after a few hours without a gloves on can kind of start to make your hands raw
So this is what we're trying to achieve is a nice smooth uh, a nice smooth transition from the crack um, something that can be sanded out easily next so it's also a good idea to kind of go through all the steps get an idea of what sands out easily and what doesn't so that you know how far to go with the chisel or with the uh, file because once you're to the point where it sands out easily it's it's less work to sand than it is to file but if there's gouges and things that are hard to sand out you're better off spending a little more time with the chisel so you do you know kind of depends on how hard the wood that you're using is and everything so it's good good to play with that a little bit just to get an idea of of what good enough is um, and what I found was these files, again, just a, a fine, regular um, wood file works best. I tried some of those kind with the big tungsten carbide sharp teeth on them. Um, they don't fit down into these grooves very well on the wood, and those also don't cut very smoothly. They just kind of shred up the wood, I find. And, these, if you go at an angle, they give a nice shear cut and can get and give make the wood very smooth. So um, I, I tried all the files I had in my drawer, and these still seem to work the best. Okay, now we got to do some sanding, a lot of sanding. Um, over here, I've already sanded, and you hope I don't know if you can kind of see very well, but this side here is the is the profile left from the files, and you can see some file marks, and you can see the edges aren't perfectly round. So basically, I'm starting with 150 grit to do all the shaping, and I'm what I'm trying to do is go from these spots where there's uh, a little bit of non-uniformity and stuff to over here where it's nice and rounded um, and then once everything is shaped nicely then I can work my way up to 220 and so forth to get the sanding marks out but using one um, so pretty coarse grit either 100 grit um, or 150 the files are file marks are pretty pretty nice uh, the file I have it cuts a pretty smooth finish so I'm just doing 150 but if you had a coarser file you might want to use a hundred grit to start with um, so uh, one other thing I wanted to point out was when you're hand sanding um, the best way I found is to take a half sheet of sandpaper and then fold it in half crease it and then fold it like this and wrap it and this way you you really maximize the use of the sandpaper. It, it stays in your hand nicely. Uh, it doesn't tear. It makes it a stiffer edge. And then when you wear out these two sides, you just simply open it up, roll it around the other way, and you got fresh sandpaper. And it, it allows you to get a lot of use out of the edges when you're sanding these edges like this, and kind of to use all of the surface area. And it, it like I said, it fits really well in your hand, and it's easy to use. Um, you, you don't want to do it this way because what that does is put sandpaper against sandpaper and it, when you're sanding with the first two outsides you'll basically wear out the sandpaper so I always fold it over itself so it's paper against sandpaper or pa paper against sand um, and then all I'm doing is you can see I've got some uh, tape on my thumbs because I'm I use my thumbs pretty heavily and after four or five hours of sanding uh, Unless your thumbs have some really good calluses on them. They're going to be uh, You're gonna be wore through the skin. So uh, This really helps and so what I do is I start with the Inside here just kind of like I did with the files and everything else. So going around like this and just sanding until those marks are gone on the inside 
So, and I just keep blowing the dust away and looking. So now I've got a, a pretty smooth round over on the, this side and gotten rid of the file mark. So then I'll go do this side. So once I got the marks out of there, then I kind of gradually just work my way over the top. So up on top here, and I'll do it like this. Nothing, there's nothing special about this. Um, it just takes a lot of time and patience and a lot of breaks to stretch your hands and arms out. And you want to make sure you get rid of all of these little divots and stuff that the file left over because um, the 220 isn't going to take that out very easily. So you want to get the shape and the scrape marks and scratches all out and basically have a nice shape left. And the only thing that you should have left when you're done is 150 grit sanding marks and then you can move to 220 and take those out and work your way up till you don't have any scratches and you've got a nice smooth surface. But So that's kind of what we're looking for right here is a nice even round over with no ridges or dips or scratches in it. And then just keep moving your way around and rotating the piece until it's all done. It's pretty simple, just uh, long. The other thing I want to mention is that people tend to be too cheap with sandpaper and try to use it too long. Um, this is something that wears out and you know if you buy good quality sandpaper it still wears out and uh, just lasts a little bit longer but you can tell when it's uh, worn out it's a lot smoother versus the sharper cutting edge and it really really makes a difference in the speed that you can sand when it's fresh so um, don't be afraid to throw uh, the sandpaper out and buy more Just buy big packs of it when you're doing this and you'll realize pretty quick when it's starting to wear out just by how much work you're having to do to make a little bit of difference but um, that's something to kind of keep in mind or a lot of people again try to be a little too cheap with their sandpaper and make it last too long. All right now I have everything sanded down to 200 or 220 grit so I went from the file to 150 to kind of shape everything and get the file marks out and then I went to 220 grit to get the 150 sand marks out and it's pretty good now but there's a, little, a few sand marks and I want to polish a little bit so from now on up it's easier to use these little uh, sanding wheels uh, they're, they're a nylon abrasive um, there's abrasive inside these little nylon sticks and I have 180 grit on the drill I'm going to do 180, 320 and 600 and I'm just really trying to get any final um, marks out of this. Um, I'm just using my Makita drill on high speed. Um, I think this is about 1500 RPM or something like that. Thir 3000 RPM. Um, but this works really well. It gets the sand marks out, uh, kind of burnishes it, polishes it up a little bit. So this is kind of the final sanding stage. And the only thing you really got to work look out for here is not to hit these washers on the ends. You want to keep just the bristles hitting it.
And again, the lathe works really well. In this case, I'm not using the indexer. I'm just using the lock. It turns every, locks every 20, um, 90 degrees. So this works well to hold it. So now we're just gonna progress through the three grits. I've already done the other half, so I only have about this much to do remaining. All right, here's the first rope mold piece done after about 20 hours. So only another 20 hours to do the second one. I had to break, break the rotary unit on the CNC out to do the end cap profiles anyway. So as long as I had it out, I used it to create a inch and a half diameter uh, set of, of pieces, round pieces that I could chop up into uh, tenons to use to hold the end cap onto the top of the corner posts. Okay, now we have the tenon glued into the end cap blank and we're running the roughing pass to get the rough shape on the um, rotary axis of the CNC. And now we're running the finish pass on the end cap and on the on the rotor unit and we're only doing the sides or edges up to kind of just barely rounding, coming around the top rounded edge. That's all we can really do accurately on the rotary unit. I don't have long enough bits to reach all the way down that face on the right side. And it tends not to be very accurate trying to do those extreme angles. Um, the modeling isn't super accurate there. And so you'll see kind of gross steps. And I have a nice little square pyramid structure on the top that I want to be nice and crisp. So. I'm not going to try and fine finish that here. I'm going to do that next uh, with just a standard XYZ uh, cl cleanup pass from the top. So now we're doing the cleanup pass from the top. And um, the way to line this up is to first get the rough square shape of the end cap parallel to the X and Y axes. Uh, I just laid a board up next to it and kind of ran the the uh, router up and down the Z, uh, X axis to make sure it was parallel to the axis and then clamped it in place. And then to center it, what I did was I moved to the left and the right uh, on the X axis and found out where the two sides were based on the digital readout of the CNC and then picked the center point and set x and then i did the same front and back on the y axis so that basically my starting x y zero zero point was perfectly centered in the in the center of this and then i could do the machining down over the edge and i stopped a little bit short of hitting the fine pass that was down in the rotary and then i what i did was i used a file to kind of have those two machining steps melt uh blend into each other because you, you're not going to get this perfect for sure um you know the line there's there's errors in your alignments and, and you're coming from two different sides and everything but with a fine file uh and a little bit of sandpaper you can blend the two together and they look perfect in the end one last thing i needed to do was cut mortises in the legs so that the tenons from the rails on the raised panel assemblies could be fit in and glued to the legs. I could have tried to do that on the CNC, but these actually are uh, two and three quarters inch deep and I don't have deep enough or long enough router bits to to go that deep right on the CNC. And my tenons were already square, so uh, I would have had to more to, if I would have used the CNC, they would have been round and then I'd have to chisel them out or I'd have to go round over the tenon. So it was just easier to use the mortise, hollow chisel mortiser on this. And frankly, this is kind of therapeutic to sit there for a while and just crunch away and, and cut some nice square slots with this. So I kind of enjoy it as long as it doesn't take too long. All right, I'm finally ready to finish this bed. Um, so again, this is 
Sapele. Uh, it's kind of a, or is a mahogany look-alike. And you can see the stripes are starting to come out on this. I've uh, let these sit kind of in the shop while I was working on other things for a week or so. So the ultraviolet light definitely brings out the stripes. Um, but I'm going to use linseed oil uh, as a first coat anyway because that's going to also really bring the stripes out. And it, the amber color of the linseed oil really brings out the color and kind of gives it a little darker tone. And I'm trying to match an existing bedroom set that I made about 20 years ago that also has linseed oil but it's, uh, it's a striped mahogany. Um, this is going to match it pretty well, but because I used, I know I used linseed oil on that to darken it a bit, I'm going to do the same thing. Then I'm going to do two coats of wipe on um, polyurethane. This is my favorite brand, Minwax. Uh, I just, I've been using that forever. <clears throat> That's kind of what I use on everything. And then after two wipe on coats to kind of fill in the pores and really get it in, into the uh, pores and cracks, then I'm going to do two coats of spray on. and. Uh, the night the reason I do that combination is um, if you start with the the polyurethane spray <coughs> excuse me on a pretty porous wood you'll end up with the the sand uh, sanded finish is kind of a you know a light colored powder and some of that gets in the pores um, with the wipe on that'll soak in and just totally disappear kind of like a sanding sealer. But if you spray over the top of that, what I find is it leaves that little light color in the pores because the spray on kind of goes over the top and doesn't soak in as well. And especially on like oak, I've noticed it can look kind of bad. So that's why I've, you know, I've kind of used, uh, found that a couple good coats of wipe on will soak in, cover those sanding, uh, sanded powder wherever you might have missed blowing or wiping it off. And it'll kind of fill in the pores and get it smooth and then you come by with a couple coats of spray on and you'll get a nice finish with you know no brush marks or or wipe marks or anything it's it's nice and clean so we're going to start with the linseed oil today and you're going to really see how this grain pops out on these raised panels all right here's how i put on linseed oil i usually put it in a cup or something that's kind of low and easy to not tip over but it's easy to dip a rag in. I just use a piece of t-shirt. Uh, generally, this is what I use for all my wipe on finishes, polyurethane or any wiping oils. Uh, try to use t-shirts that are light colored. White is the best uh, just because I've seen sometimes the dyes will come out or the lint, like if you have a bright red shirt, sometimes the lint gets caught in uh, the cracks or something and <clears throat> the the colored ones really show, but uh, this the the uh, dye won't come out of a white one, obviously, because there's no white. Uh, so I uh, just soak in a bunch. The nice thing about linseed oil is it washes off your hands very nicely. Um, so soap and water comes out clean, so you don't need to wear gloves. Now you can really see how this just pops the grain of that sapile out. Um, it looks exactly like striped mahogany. Mahogany has the same effect. It really starts to look good when you put this on. Um, what I do with the linseed oil is basically I'll put on uh, a couple of coats. Like this is end grain down here. Um, really soak this in. You'll see it uh, soak up and then kind of turn dry pretty quick. I just keep putting it on uh, until it kind of stops soaking in and it's even going to it's going to dry out, especially on the end grain, pretty quick like that. But you can see on some of these stripes, because that's why there are stripes, the grain's turning up, and so those soak in more. I'll just keep wiping this on for a few minutes in this area until I know I've got plenty soaked in here. And then I'll just let it sit for maybe an hour or two. And then I'll come back in a few hours, and most of it, you can see how it's kind of dried up down here, but there'll be some some wet streaks where there's where there's uh you know no end grain popping up or where the wood's a little harder and hasn't soaked in you know just come back and wipe this off until it has kind of a dull matte look to it in a couple hours and then just let it sit overnight and dry um, sometimes if you're in a real humid climate since i'm in arizona and it's 105 degrees right now in my garage um, 
and relatively dry. It's maybe probably not even 30% today. Uh, this is gonna this is gonna be solid. Probably by tonight, I can flip this over and put the other coat on the back side. Um, and I'm only gonna put just you know this one really heavy soaked in coat uh, of linseed oil on. It's really just to soak in and give it the color. Uh, it's not a, you know, linseed oil is not a protective finish anyway. It's it's like any other oil finish. It's really not very protective, but it, it, I like the color that it gives the sapile and, and some other woods too. So that's why I'm putting it on here. So that's all there is to it. You really can't mess this up. Uh, it doesn't have to be super clean out here. You can be doing this out in a wind, you know, windy area with dust because you're going to wipe this off anyway. Um, in a couple of hours, so if there's a little dust in it, who cares? It's going to wipe off nice. So it's kind of a foolproof uh, first coat, really. So again, we're just putting a lot on here. Um, I, the only thing I'm looking out for is not to put so much on that it runs through this panel and comes out the back side. It will be, it will mat balance out when I put the other coat on, but I don't really don't want big globs of it dried on the back side because uh, I'll have to clean that up. So I'm just soaking it in here, but not so much that it runs in there. And that's all there is to it. Like I said, in a couple hours, I'll come back and I'll just kind of give it a light brush like that um, and then let it sit overnight, but pretty simple. Okay, now I'm putting the, going to put the first coat of spray on finish here. This has got two rubbed on coats of polyurethane that followed the coat of linseed oil and I put the polyurethane on just like I did the linseed oil, wiped it on, um, smoothed it off. I, I don't go back and wipe it in a couple hours like the linseed oil because the polyurethane dries much faster so you just spread it on evenly with a rag and while it's still wet uh, go back and forth make a bunch of passes to really smooth it out um, so it can dry evenly. But now I'm just like in between all coats I have 600 grit sandpaper and I'm just I, I'm not trying to sand it down a lot I'm just trying to make it smooth so I can feel just slight grains of dust and um, some of the grain is still raising up from the wood so I'm going to hold it down very flat and keep going with the grain now if you want you don't want to create any scratches so I'm trying not to push hard on it or anything and I'm always going with the grain uh, and then we're going to do the ends here. And on these radiuses, you have to be really careful that you don't dig in. So I bend it in the shape of the curve and I just give it a little bit. That's about it. I don't want to cut through the finish anymore. It's very easy to cut through. And I use my finger press right in the middle of the edge to get a nice sanded edge again without risking digging through the finish, because again, I don't want to remove finish, I'm just trying to take the rough spots off the top. All right, now I've lightly sanded with 600 grit. Um, I blew off all the really loose dust, then I used a clean rag to wipe the surface off, which gets the dust out of the grain holes. And then I do a final blow off, again, just to make sure there's nothing in nothing left on top and I, I usually double check with my hand. I, I wash, wipe my hand off so it's clean. Uh, it's very smooth now and you can see it got dull obviously from sanding it but it doesn't have any um, any bumps or anything on it now. So we're going to spray it on. Again I'm using uh, clear satin. Satin's just my favorite finish. It, uh, I think it looks best on wood but that's really just a personal taste. So I'm going to Shake it up, make sure the if the ball runs smoothly around the bottom of the rim, like this, you can kind of hear it. It's not skipping or bouncing around. That means everything's mixed up and you don't have solids on the bottom. If it's kind of making a clicking sound and bouncing around, it doesn't roll smoothly around the rim on the bottom. You know you got to keep uh, shaking some more. Uh, this stuff generally doesn't settle like spray paint, so it doesn't take a lot of shaking. Now I have this nozzle on these. You can adjust for a vertical spray pattern or a horizontal spray pattern. In this case, um, I want a vertical spray because I'm going to be going left to right with this. So I've got the I've got this adjusted in that manner, and I, I want 
pretty dust free environment, uh, relatively dust free here. So I've got all my fans turned off. I've got my garage doors shut. Um, I'm, I'm only going to be spraying these two boards so I'm not wearing a mask. Uh, but if I were doing a lot of spraying that's really going to cloud up before I get out of here, I would be wearing a mask. The other thing I do is I always back the cars out of the garage because this will drift and it will stick to your paint and your windshields on your, on your vehicles um, across even 20 or 30 feet away. So um, it's a good idea to remove those. So now we're just going to put down some even coats. I usually start with the edges and then work my way across the top. And I always look across at an angle to see the shininess. That's how I judge how even of a coat I'm putting on. So I always want to have windows in my background or light sources on the opposite side of my work so I can look at that reflection. That's the best way to really tell if I'm putting down enough or too much. So here we go. What I'm looking for is a good even shine. I don't want any spots to look like they're building up so thick that they're that they're like a puddle and I don't want any dull spots. All right, that was the first spray coat. Um, a lot of times that might be all you need. It just depends on how much protection you want and how good this finish came out. So sometimes uh, it might turn out a little rougher than I want, so I'll do one more coat, sand it down again, and spray it. Sometimes, like in this case, these are the outside boards of the side rails, so I want, they're, they're going to have a tendency to get more uh, punishment, you know, from people rubbing against them and banging into it. So I want some really heavy finish on this, so I'm going to put another solid coat on these uh, whereas say the back of the headboard is up against the wall it really doesn't need anything more so I probably won't put another coat on that and that's the whole video uh, if you made it this far I really appreciate you watching it um, if you like this kind of content please uh, hit like and subscribe that helps me out and you're welcome to add any questions or comments down below in the questions or comments section on YouTube and any suggestions for future uh, videos uh, I'm always open to as well. Thanks a lot for watching.